This is episode number 194 with Lance Allred. New concepts and ideas to help you reach your full potential. Reach your full potential. Reach your full potential. Small win, small win, small win. Keep your momentum going. The Success 101 Podcast. Welcome to the Success 101 Podcast. This is your host, Jared Warren. And each episode, my goal is to bring you a new concept or idea to help you maximize your full potential. Thanks for joining me here today. Now let's kick things off. Yo, what's up, boys and girls? Welcome back to the Success 101 Podcast. Super excited today. When am I not? Super excited today about our guest, Lance Allred. You'll hear about his dynamic story here in just a moment. But a couple of things that I want to mention first is that my coaching program over on the website, success101podcast.com forward slash coaching, has been awesome with the results that it's had. The coaching clients I'm working with, the transformational changes they're going through, the feedback that I'm getting from those programs, it's just been awesome. I spent two years working on this content, getting it exactly the way that I wanted it, that I thought would be hugely impactful. For my clients going through this program, success101podcast.com forward slash coaching will take you there. There's four different models to choose from. Go pick the one that's right for you. Give me a shout. Let's do a consultation to see if it makes sense for you. You can contact my team directly at info at success101podcast.com or just fill out the form on the website. That'll bring you right into us as well. Look forward to meeting more of you out there. Also very, very excited that Blue Apron has teamed up with the Success 101 podcast. And if you guys have never checked out Blue Apron, it's time you did. They're basically the Netflix of meal kit delivery services. There's a few more out there, but they're really disrupting the market with what they're doing and have been for quite some time. I'm just so glad to be partnered with them now. They've smoothed out a lot of the issues with delivery service when it comes to food, how it gets to you, the process. Some of the early food delivery services were using a lot of just crap that you don't want, a lot of preservatives. Because look, it's delicate to ship food, right? Blue Apron's got it down to a science. And ordering this stuff's really simple. You can have your entire meal line lined out in about 15 minutes. And they've got a huge range of options. They've got a brand new Mediterranean diet that I'll mention in just a moment. But if you're like me and my family, where we're busy and going all the time, we've got kids to feed, we've got all sorts of stuff going on, and we don't want to just grab junk all the time, which is the easy solution for most families out there, or most people with a super hectic schedule, even if you don't have kids. Like I said, Blue Apron is like the Netflix. It is the solution for you to get quality food, wide range of food, easy on your doorstep. You guys are going to love it if you've never checked it out. So here's what we're doing for Success 101 Podcast listeners. If you head to the website, success101podcast.com forward slash blue apron, I've got two links over there that you can follow. The first one is three meals free on your first blue apron order. So the first order you put in, you're going to get three free meals. This is pretty perfect for someone who wants to try this service out, but they're not sure if they want to commit or how this is going to work. They want to ease into it. Go buy a meal. Most of their meals work out to less than $10 per person. Anything quality like this that you're buying at any restaurant that you go to, you're going to spend a lot more for that anyway. Might as well do it in the comfort of your home. And it's fun to make all the stuff anyway. If you like cooking and a nice bottle of red wine like I do, you can turn this into a fun night as well. It's not just the eating part of it. The other part is their new Mediterranean diet, which looks phenomenal. I've not had an order of this shipped to me yet, but I'm so excited to put my first order in since they've come out with this just introduced. You're going to get $40 off of your first two boxes. Again, pretty perfect for someone that might want to ease into this. $40 off of your first two boxes of the new Mediterranean diet. So again, head to success101podcast.com forward slash blue apron. You'll see the two links there. Click on the one that you want. Give me your feedback of how you're loving it once you get the food. Again, turn it into a fun night. Turn it into a night where you know you're eating healthy, all fresh ingredients, tons of options. And I think you guys are going to be real believers of Blue Apron once you try their service. They really do have it down to a science, and it's awesome, awesome food. Now, on to our incredible episode today with Lance Allred. Couldn't wait to get this guy on the podcast. Lance was the first deaf player in NBA history. That's right. How does that work? You'll find out today on our episode. Expert on leadership, perseverance, grit, everything that involves peak performance. He was legally deaf at 80% hearing loss from RH complications at birth, which you'll hear today is a blood disorder. 
and not even starting to play basketball until eighth grade because his life was so sheltered and everybody told him he couldn't play sports because of his hearing loss. Just an amazing story. He's authored four books. He's an international speaker. Just an awesome, awesome guy with an awesome message, which is why I knew I had to get him on today. So let's get to it. Without any further delay, let's jump right into my conversation with Lance Allred. Lance Allred, welcome to the Success 101 podcast, buddy. So excited to have you here. Thanks for having me, Jared. I am excited, like I said, because you've got such a different and dynamic message to bring to the guests today. And based on our listening base and what the audience wants, I know that you're I know your message, what I've heard from you before, is going to be awesome with some really actionable takeaways. I'm sure we're going to talk through your amazing book, the fact that you were the first legally deaf player in the NBA, and then just some of your background. I mean, that alone, we could do a whole podcast on on what I've just mentioned alone, but talk to us a little bit about your mindset of how you got to where you are today, what that background looks like, and then I think we're just going to branch off into a ton of peak performance items here that the listeners are going to take a lot away from. I didn't make the NBA until I was 27 years old. That's seven years longer than my peers seven years longer than the average player, and most people would have given up. Achieving our dreams and our goals is not easy as much as social media or the internet would like to sell us otherwise, that there's all these time hacks to suddenly making a million dollars, and more importantly, suddenly you'll be happy. And I'll allude to that part a little bit later down the line with my story. And I get to tell people my little mantra every day is the essence of leadership is perseverance and the essence of perseverance is grit and the essence of grit is choice. Do you choose to get back up every time you get knocked down? I was born in a polygamous commune in my grandmother's bedroom, not in a traditional hospital. And they didn't think about things called RH factor. My mother was a negative. I was a positive. Her body was recognizing me as a parasite. And so it was killing me off. And so when I was born, I was nearly dead. And my mom finally took me out of the commune into the county hospital in Montana there where there was a John Hopkins educated resident. He specialized in RH because he was an RH baby himself. So it was dumb luck. And he said, there's no reason why, logical scientific reason why I was alive. I should have been dead by all numbers. Leadership is a lot of things. Through my examples of playing around the world, every continent of the world, except for Antarctica, I've seen prevalent pitfalls transcend cultures and what people think leadership is. To me, leadership is, one, understanding that not everyone's going to like you. You can't make all the popular choices. Leadership isn't easy. It's actually quite lonely. And I get to share all these experiences to corporations across the country to talk to them about what leadership is. And again, uh, it's the lessons of leadership is perseverance. Perseverance meaning, are you a leader who's actually walked the walk? I mean, would I want to take parenting advice from someone who's never been a parent? Do I really want to take coaching basketball advice from someone who's actually never really played a high-level game of basketball? No, not really. Sorry. So perseverance, are you someone that's actually paid a price? And the essence of perseverance is grit. And the essence of grit is choice. Do you choose to get back up every time you get knocked down? There's no magic wand to that. What I have, again, on my website is a free daily perseverance tracker. It's a set of questions I ask myself every day, but it's something that I get to hold myself accountable with. And my five principles of perseverance are accountability, integrity, compassion, discomfort, and being a leader of your own life. And so accountability being my mom her oversight as a parent, she very easily could have blamed the religious leaders in our commune for poor advice and been a victim about the RH factor and said it wasn't her fault. Or she did what she chose to do, which was make me wear my hearing aids and make me go to speech therapy because there were no amenities to learn sign language in rural Montana. So I had to be thrown into the fire every day, pushed out of my comfort zone and made to wear my hearing aids and be challenged to learn to speak, being a speech therapist until I was 16, reminded every day that I wasn't normal. And I hated that. I hated being reminded that I wasn't normal because I just wanted to fit in. But again, um, leadership is lonely. You're never going to quite fit in, but that's not your path. I think one of your phrases that you love to use when it comes to leadership is, you know, being a lion and a leader. I want to dive into that. I want to talk a little bit more about your five principles as well, why you chose those of everything you could have chosen. 
I think the I think the burning question on everyone's mind, I know it would be me, is you talked about being legally deaf because of the RH factor, which is a which is a blood factor. Yeah. How are you able to do this podcast being deaf? I have fancy hearing aids and Bluetooth technology that now I know what the context of the conversation is, that I over routine, I know a lot of times what are we going to be talking about? And I so taking the vowel shifts, A E I O U, in the context of the conversation, I know, okay, he's probably going to be asking questions about this topic, speaking or basketball. So most people, we speak in patterns. Right. And you learn to figure out those patterns and you piece together the vowel shifts. Now, it's a great age to be deaf with digital technology, uh, with Bluetooth and everything that work with my uh, headphones. Growing up, all we had back then was analog. And there's no way I could have done it back then, but it's a it's a wonderful time to be deaf, no doubt. So if you only had analog today, there's just no way that you would even you're deaf to the point. There's no way you'd even be able to hear what I'm saying or make it out in any way. If if we only had analog today, yeah, no, that would be very difficult. And you didn't even you mentioned not even having the resources to to learn sign language back then, which obviously kiddos in your position coming up today, most of them are going to have that. Yes. On the basketball court, players would be yelling at you, refs would be saying stuff, and you couldn't hear that either. So, I mean, there's a tremendous amount of determination you had to go through without even knowing a ton about your story. People can pick up on that, just the fact that you had to grow. And I'm sure those life lessons of not having sign language even further made you strengthen and grow into the person you are today, correct? Yeah. I I don't want to ever, ever shame anybody. But if I had been given the comfort zone of sign language, I would not have been able to go and do the things I wanted to do with my life. What basketball team around the world was going to suddenly stop their entire culture and fit me in and have a a sign language interpreter following around and constantly communicating? Only a few people with exceptional talent like LeBron James would have teams do that for them. And so I learned very early on If I wanted to live an exceptional life, I had to first understand that I was not an exception and I was not entitled to anything, that if I wanted something, I had to go earn it. And when I got knocked down, it was always my choice to get back up. And there were many times I wanted to quit. Oh, trust me. The the say that it was easy would be a lie. I can imagine. different sets of skills. One, my eyesight is exceptional, but also you develop even more peripheral vision. That when you're playing on a basketball court, you're always keeping your head on a swivel, but learning to really see out of the side of your eyes. The human body is an amazing thing. It learns to adapt and to adjust. And studies have shown that when you lose one sense, the other senses kick in. And in my case, that's very true. My sense of sight, my sense of feel, the sense that, yes, something is happening over my shoulder that like almost like you have eyes in the back of your head sometimes. It's it's an odd thing to explain, but uh, you feel it develop through the years. But my little joke is that, yes, people all my life have been telling me what I can and can't do. I simply choose not to listen. I can't hear anyway. (laughs) That's right. You've got a good excuse to not listen to them. Yeah. My very first game as a basketball player, I didn't start playing until I was 14 because that's when we escaped from polygamy. And I grew from 5'10 to 6'4 that year. And I didn't have any friends in this new school. And I figured, hey, I guess a good way to fit in, I'll start playing basketball. And my very first game, I was ejected by the official because he thought I was ignoring him and being a jerk. Wow. And yeah, from then, early on, everyone's saying, no, nah, he's too deaf. He can't play. Again, at the end of the day, we have a lot more choice than we want to admit. And it was still my choice. Again, when you empower yourself with the accountability of choice, Taking full accountability, knowing that no one else is responsible for my happiness, for my path, for my choices. That's accountability. And my mom taught me that when, again, she made me wear my hearing aids. She made me go to speech therapy. And I was brutal to her, I, and, but she never backed down. As, as cruel as I was to her at times, she never backed down because she was doing her best to ameliorate her oversight as a parent with RH. And she was never a victim about it. And so when I started playing basketball early on, at the age of 14, I made myself a very a promise very quickly that I was never going to use my hearing as an excuse. And there were many times that throughout my career, especially playing overseas, where you have coaches that don't want to use hand signals because they think their plays are brilliant, but you only have 24 seconds in a shot clock. You can only be so brilliant, which is always frustrating. They wouldn't use hand signals. And so I had to, a lot of times, just very quickly assess where my teammates are at, do my best to read my teammates' mouths and then quickly run to the spot where I was supposed to be. 
And but every now and then, yeah, I'd run the wrong play and the coach would freak out. And and I very easily could have said, hey, you know, coach, you know, give me a hand signal. This is unfair. But instead I said, you're right, coach. I forgot the play. And here's the thing. Yes, everyone, a lot of people going to say, well, what about communication? You should have open communication in companies. Yes, there's a time and a place for it. But in the heat of battle, in the middle of a game, when you try to prove that you're right, you only make matters worse. There's always a time and a place where you can address it later. And being right gets you is, is overrated. What does it get you? You know, I'm a cookie. And so whenever I tried to challenge a coach, it only made matters worse. And whenever I just said, okay, you're right, or even if it wasn't my fault, and I just said, okay, and I owned it and I took responsibility for it, everyone forgot about it and you moved on to the next thing. But whenever you feel you have to be right, you just make the issue worse. That's the thing about accountability. In this day and age, especially with social media, eh, we'll talk about Trump for a second. When you take full credit for your failures and even things that aren't your failures, you can truly take credit for your success. But you have this culture where people, when things go bad, oh, I wasn't a part of that. But when things are going really well, oh, yeah, I was there the entire time. Ronald Reagan learned from Richard Nixon's mistake. Ronald Reagan, if you remember Contragate, he jumped right ahead of it and he took full accountability for it, even though he really wasn't responsible. Absolutely. And that's and people forgave him. You had Nixon who tried to hide things. You had Clinton who tried to dance around his issues. If Clinton had just owned it right out of the gate, people would have said, okay, all right. But when you lie about it and you try not to take accountability for things, that's what bothers people. It's a lack of leadership. But what Reagan did, why people loved him so much, is that, yeah, it, it stops with me. People don't understand. If you just own it, if you own your baggage, you own your mistakes, just own it, that is inspiring for people. Yeah, and you mentioned the world of of politics. I think the same way in the NBA as well. You know better than I do. But behind closed doors, I'm sure there's plenty of people always want to be there when the good things happen, place blame, deflect, whatever things uh, go bad. I know you played with uh, LeBron back in 2007, 2008 season. Was uh, I think Mike Brown was the coach at that time. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, and you guys had a great season. You finished second in the NBA Central, and then I think the I think that's the year you guys lost to the Celtics. Boston, yeah. We lost to Boston in Game 7. Uh, if I know if we had beaten Boston in Game 7 the year they won the championship, we would have gone on to win it. So as we were that close. But Mike Brown was a good coach. Uh, he he didn't he, – he wasn't someone that overpromised. He, he was someone that could take ownership of things. People don't understand that is inspiring. And accountability is part of leadership, being able to own it. That's the first reason. When you take full accountability of things and ownership of things, you can truly take credit of your success. So that's part of the principles of perseverance because you're going to make mistakes. You're going to fall down. And it's your choice to get back up. And it's that much easier to get back up when you know that you have been functioning in your full integrity, and that's the second one, taking ownership of those failures and choosing to learn from them. And that allows this journey of life to just be a little bit easier to navigate. Because when you take accountability from things, you're learning from them, so you're not repeating the same mistakes. And you're learning your lessons and you're growing. That's what accountability helps you do. So you don't keep falling into these loopholes uh, and patterns. And then integrity is my favorite one, but it's also the greatest Achilles heel of all these coaches I played for. My parents, we actually got, my parents got into a power struggle with other men in authority positions in our polygamous commune. And my father was very threatening to them because my grandfather was the leader of our polygamous commune before he was killed, four years before I was born. But a lot of people expected my father to ascend. And so he was a threat to other men in power. And everyone loved my parents because my parents treated everyone in our polygamous commune. And it's ironic, yes, we're a socialist utopian commune. Every, my parents treated everyone exactly the same. That's not, but wait, it's socialism. Everyone should be treated exactly the same. No. And I learned very early that socialism is a beautiful idea, but it can never work on this planet because different people had different sets of work ethic values and entitlement. So for socialism to work, we all have to have the same values. 
we all have to have the same work ethic. We all have the same have to have the same degree of entitlement, and we don't. And one thing I've learned playing in all these continents around the world <laughs> is every culture thinks they have the best values. Yes, I appreciate the values I was raised with, but having traveled around the world and seeing other people who were great people, but they had different values. And I'm going to go off on a little tangent here. I've learned to view the human brain as like an empty computer hard drive. You have your DNA and some things that make every hard drive just a little bit dearer. Maybe this computer is more sturdy. Maybe this one's a little defected, whatever. But the culture you're raised into is the operating system that's installed into your hard drive. That's your cultural operating system. And yet every cultural operating system thinks they have the best values, the best coding, the best algorithm. And so you have a Japanese coach who's looking at me with his Microsoft brain saying, why isn't that American Macintosh computer operating at the same algorithms I am? Obviously, they must come from an inferior culture. You see that all around the world. That's what a lot of my TED talk was about. What is your polygamy? Is challenging people to actually address what culture you grew up in. And are these absolute truths that you grew up with truly absolute? Or are they just blinders that we have that allow us to believe that we have all the answers? And the notion that you're right is actually a limiting comfort zone. It allows you to believe that you don't have to learn anything new, that you don't have to grow. It allows you to believe that you can stay inside your bubble and you already have all the answers. Oh, I don't need to leave the United States because we're already the best country in the world. And the world is a scary place. Actually, it's not. Playing in the Middle East, playing in Asia, playing in South America. Yes, there is, are some neighborhoods you don't walk into, just like in America. But when people have these notions that they have absolute truth, all I see is fear and comfort zones. So coming back to all that, my parents treated everyone exactly the same. So from their example, here's how I define integrity. I ask myself a question every single night. Are you the same person in every room that you walk into? And actually, for most people, especially for most coaches, they cannot answer yes. That when the cameras are on and the media and the reporters are there, they're Mr. Charming. But behind closed door, they're Mr. Hyde. It's so shocking to me that people can do that. I'm like, I'm right here. I've been in this room the entire time. And I've watched you change personalities three times. It's alarming, actually. And the saying goes that no man can serve two masters. And I respond with that, especially if those two masters reside within the same psyche. Because we'd have coaches that would say one thing on camera, but behind closed door, they'd say a different thing. And we're like, well, wait, are we doing this? Or are we doing that? When you have a leader or a coach who's always changing his personalities, it also lets you know that they do not have your back. Because say what you want to about Bobby Knight. Yes, he was brutal. He was mean. He was grumpy. He was impatient. But he was the same person everywhere he went. <laughs> You'd always knew what you were going to get. And there's some stability with that. Knowing that when you have a coach like that, like this last coach I played for in Puerto Rico, when he could tell it to me straight, I knew that he would have no problem in turning around and telling the owner straight too, and he would have my back. When you have owners and leaders who are always – doing the whole multiple personality thing, climbing their way up the ladder, you know that they care more about themselves than anybody else. Right. They won't have your back. When I had these coaches that were always afraid of their own jobs and they were always doing the whole personality thing, those teams had so much high turnover, uh, players being cut and sent home, whereas the coaches who had no problem holding their ground – who would lose their jobs first before they let other players go. The thing is, they were the more successful coaches anyway because you allowed for they allowed for the stability and the chemistry to build. So integrity, are you the same person in every room that you walk into? It might take you a little bit longer to get to where you're going when you're not scheming and manipulating. It might take you a little bit longer, but you'll get there. And... When things are dark, when you're down and out, it's that much easier to put your shoes on every morning, knowing that you stay true to who you are. And so 
integrity is the most important one to me. That's part of perseverance, knowing that I stay true to who I am. And I haven't lost my core. I was going to say, when you talk about perseverance too, obviously from your story early on, we've talked about what you had to go through with the family, you were the family dynamic you were in, you almost, you know, dying as a baby, those sort of things, but then making it up through school in a sport where typically, you know, you have to be able to hear what's going on. You fought through all of that. And I know one time in your TED talk, you said, why do we care if we fail? I think many people listening in would argue that we should care. What was your main point behind that? Failure to me means you're simply stepping outside your comfort zone, that you're trying something new. Now, there's different types of failure, obviously. The failure of being complacent, of playing it safe, of just doing the bare minimum to get by, of staying inside your bubble, playing it safe, that's failure. That's called being mediocre. Because here's the great irony of basketball teams. That yes, you do want structure, you want foundations, you want principle, but basketball is just like life. There are some things that are going to come your way that you aren't quite prepared for. Do you have the confidence and the grit to improvise and adjust on the fly and be willing to think outside the bubble and take a risk? And the coaches that had to hold on so tight to their control that didn't want their players to take any risk. Yes, those teams I played on always did well in the regular season. But when playoffs came, the teams where the coaches trusted their players to improvise and think on the fly and adjust versus the coaches who always had to stick with a game plan that would not adapt, the teams where the players had the confidence to make mistakes and take risk, those are the teams that always won. The players that were willing to take a risk, that were willing to fail, that were willing to step outside their comfort zone, that we're willing to try something new. And so again, when everyone's so afraid of this word called failure, to me, I've failed so many times in my life. And that's because I was always forced outside my comfort zone. From the earliest stage, my mom making me wear my hearing aids and do speech therapy and have the courage to speak and sound different and sound funny and have people make fun of me, to have the courage to try to play basketball and walk around like a deaf kid on the court and have people laugh and make fun of me. To try something new, that's where my success has come from. That's the power of failure. And so when people are afraid to make mistakes, you're not going to achieve anything great. So I would tell people, go fail, fail a million times. But I choose to keep getting back up every single time. So I have my principles of perseverance. Sure, it's kind of like a system, but I would challenge anyone, develop your own questions of how you hold uh, my daily perseverance tracker. Develop your own. Companies love to try to find, oh, what I want best practices. I want a system that I can give to my employees. And all all I would tell them is like, okay, does your system actually allow them a safe space to take risk and try something new? And And are you as their leader open and confident enough in your position as a leader to be willing to allow feedback and collective input and grow as a culture? Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I want growth. I want my employees be, to be willing to take risk and fail. But a lot of them really aren't. Now, again, we don't want employees failing from lack of effort because they're being selfish and they just don't care. No, that's the same as a basketball. You have teammates that are ball hogs and they take horrible shots. That's not because they're, oh, I'm willing to fail and try something new. That's just them looking out for themselves and not caring about anybody. But you want a team, a culture, where all of your teammates know that you're in a safe spot where you can fail and you're all going to be there to help each other get back up when you do fail. And you keep trying and learning from trial and error what works and what doesn't. And so when everyone's afraid of this word called failure, um, again, I don't get it. You want to fail. That's where the growth is. The growth is always just outside the comfort zone. And uh, my mom, again, pushing me outside my comfort zone every day, I was never really allowed the luxury of a comfort zone. And I'm curious too, Lance, on a team like you were on, high caliber team, where you got guys like LeBron, you got Ben Wallace. Let's face it, you got some guys with some strong personalities on that team, and that's an understatement. How did you have to push through some of that in order to push to the top, make yourself a leader? overcome some of that adversity when you've got a lot of noise around you on the court? There's a lot of noise, no doubt. 
a lot of noise. You got teammates, everyone's worried about their job. Are they going to get cut? You have coaches, everyone worried about their job. And so you have cultures of fear. And so again, you want to have a culture, a team of trust, and they feel safe to fail. Whereas you have teams where people are afraid to fail, and that's a team of fear. And people, again, we operate in two modes, fear or trust. So when you have a culture that is afraid of failure, everyone's going to do the bare minimum to get by. Everyone's going to look out for themselves first and foremost. And so, but on teams like with the Cavaliers, to stand out, again, integrity. Are you the same person in every room that you walk into? If you're the same person in every room that you walk into, people will remember that. And they will respect it. And a lot of them will wish they had the courage to do the same, but they don't because they operate from a place of fear. They have to keep manipulating. They have to keep jockeying for position. As a kid, I dealt with a lot of bullying and even suicidal depression. But I learned one thing was, okay. I was I began asking a question when they would come and try to take my hearing kids out and throw them in the bushes or whatnot. And I would ask, what is going on in their home life that is so bad that they want to come at me to make me feel worthless. Maybe their dad beats them. Maybe their mom doesn't care about them at all. You learn that people inflict pain because they are in pain. And people are hurting you because they're operating from a place of fear. And so you realize that it's not about you. And so when people betray you and they throw you under the bus on your path to your dream, you realize it's really not about you. It's their own internal dialogue and their own fear. Again, we operate from two places, trust or fear. And they're operating from a place of fear that they won't be special, that they won't be good enough if you achieve your dream, that they will somehow have failed, that if you are successful, it means they can't be successful, which is a, la a mentality of lack, which is very prevalent in our culture. That you realize that when people, again, they betray you, it's not about you. And so on your dark days, when you feel like giving up and you feel abandoned and your team no longer wants you and you've been cut, you remind yourself that it's not about you. And that, allow that makes it that much easier to get back up and keep playing on. And therefore, knowing that if you stay true to who you are, again, integrity, and people still betray you, you realize it's not about you. That is awesome. Lance, thanks so much for sharing with us today. What a powerful message. I want to be able to steer people over to your book and to your TED Talk. Where's the best place people can find out more about you and the message that you're sending and everything that you're doing? Oh, yeah. You can see my TED Talk and my book and my uh, free TEDx training webinar at LanceAllRed41.com. Awesome. And I'll link all of that up in show notes. And thanks so much for your message here today. Thank you, Jared. Guys, I loved having Lance on the show today and hope you took a ton away from his peak performance message. If you would like to connect with me, please shoot an email to my team at info at success101podcast.com or you can catch me in the world of social media on Twitter under the name at Warren Jared, on Instagram at success101podcast or catch me over on the podcast Facebook community page. I'll catch you guys on the next awesome episode of the Success 101 Podcast. Until then.